Okay. Um, thanks very much to the organizers for inviting me. Um, this talk is going to be a little bit in the same vein as the last two talks. We'll be talking about uh, terrorist organizations, um, although I'm going to take a, quite a different approach. Um, so this is collaborative work uh, done in sort of several parts, but most of it was done with, with Christian Gledich, um, along with some other folks, Maxwell Young in computer science at Drexel, Cosmo Shalizi in statistics at CMU, and Mark Newman in physics at Michigan. Um, okay, so um, we're going to be talking about terrorism, so let's start with a definition. Um, there are lots of definitions of terrorism out there. Every different sort of major agency in the U.S. government that cares about terrorism has their own definition. They vary in very subtle ways. This is the definition that approximately most academics who study this subject use. So it's a violent act by non-governmental actors uh, that's intended to create fear for political purposes. And each of these pieces is actually very critical. So for instance, um, the political purposes rules out economic reasons. Uh, so like the mafia, for instance, would be excluded from studies like this. It's not terrorism because the motivation is not political purposes. Uh, that would be a non-governmental action and it could create fear and it could be a violent act, but because the reason for the action is not political, specifically political, uh, we don't classify that as terrorism. Um, and this non-governmental actors part is actually very important because it distinguishes terrorism from below, which is from things like rebel groups or individual citizens, uh, along from terrorism from above, which is when the government does things, like when Saddam Hussein gassed the Kurds. So this is really going to be a talk about terrorism from below. Okay. So there are lots of ways of studying terrorism. Um, common approaches, uh, if you're in the government, um, you're really interested in sort of operational uh, studies, uh, case studies, or thinking about attack prevention. Uh, so for instance, when I give talks to people in the military, they're really focused on that last question because that's their day-to-day -day concern. How do we actually protect the guys on the ground uh, and help prevent the terrorists from doing what they're doing? Um, on the academic side, it's quite different. We want to care about, um, we, ca we care about the uh, question of why, um, Typically, the studies are focusing on highly aggregated things, thinking about country level, um, what leads a conflict to have actors that use terrorism as a strategy. Um, often, we use a look at stack, static models instead of dynamic models. Uh, there's a big focus on motivation, so why do people use this tactic in general? Um, and the, of course, when it comes to the data, people use the general linear model to do the analysis, and sometimes game theory to do formal modeling. Um, this approach is going to be very different from those kinds of things. We're going to focus on identifying and trying to understand these large-scale global patterns um, in terrorism data. We're going to focus on questions about macro, political, or social processes. It's going to be very data-driven, so we're going to look at the data a lot in order to understand what kinds of patterns are even worth thinking about uh, to begin with. We're going to use algorithms and probabilistic models, and we're going to use a bunch of interdisciplinary language and ideas. So as a warm-up, let's just think about the frequency of attacks of different size. Uh, the data we're going to use is from this now defunct database. Um, it's my favorite. It was really good when it was around. Um, but the Department of Homeland Security decided they didn't want to fund two different data collection uh, groups. And so this is the one that lost. Uh, the National Memorial Institute for the Prevention of Terrorism, um, it covered about 40 years of time uh, worldwide, so almost every country was included, domestic plus international events, although there are some subtleties there. They only collected international events, th they only collected domestic events since the Oklahoma City bombing attack. So the database has 30 years of just international and then 10 years of international plus domestic. Um, it does cover the entire world, uh, and it's a lot of events, so about 36,000 events is a lot. Um, there's a, a, the one people use today is the Global Terrorism Database uh, out of University of Maryland. That one is at least twice as big, uh, but it has a different definition of what terrorism is. So it includes things like ethnic cleansings, which are, which are valuable and interesting to look at, but you have to do additional filtering to make sure that you're only looking at certain kinds of events. Whereas the MIPT data was very clean and consistent about how things were collected and, and coded. This gives you an example of one of the records in the database. You can see here that it lists how many people died, injured, some details about what kind of attack it was, who did it, when it was, et cetera. Okay, so we're going to focus on the things that are easily quantifiable and measurable, which is this number right here, the number of deaths. Okay. So specifically, we're going to ask the question of, of when do the severe events happen? These are the ones that everybody cares about um, in terms of counterterrorism. Uh, here are some examples of some very severe events, um, things you, some of you probably lived through. Uh, certainly, I think everyone in the room lived through September 11th, which was the most severe terrorist attack in the world. Um, and uh, these, sort of, these have a... A uh, disproportionate impact on both political discourse and policy. Um, I mean, when 9/11 happened, uh, you know, that's that's less than a tenth of how many people die in car accidents in the U.S. every year, and yet it rearranged the entire United States uh, military infrastructure, you know, costing trillions of dollars uh, over over time. Uh, so, disproportionate effect on policy uh, and other kinds of decision making. So, we really care about these kinds of events. Uh, how often do they happen? Who does them? Et cetera, et cetera. 
Okay, so let's look at the data just from a very simple perspective. Here's a histogram that shows you how often an event of a certain size happens. So the x-axis is death per attack. I've just bend it for convenience. And you can see that the vast majority of terrorism attacks don't kill many people. And in fact, I think the average is about four. So 92%, if you will, is considered you know, what you might call normal terrorism. Um, and uh, if we take a threshold of uh, this bend boundary right here, so if you kill 10 or more, we're going to call that severe terrorism. It's only 8% of events, but those are the events that we really care about. Okay, so um, I'm hiding a lot of information from you by showing you this in this sort of logarithmic bend structure. So let me show you the histogram in the raw form. Um, it looks like this. Some of you are familiar with the notion of a power law distribution. It turns out that this data does indeed follow a power law distribution from 10 and above. You do your nice uh, hypothesis test and you fail to reject the power law as a hypothesis for that data, uh, which is interesting and kind of surprising. It says some things about uh, the frequency of large events. 9-11, of course, is out here, and you can see that it kind of falls on the line. A little bit above, but that's out, that's out there where there's not much data. And so the fact that it falls so close to the line suggests that, you know, 9-11, maybe you couldn't have predicted 9-11 in specific, but if you had if you'd hidden this point and observe the data up to that point, you would say, well, I can tell you the probability of seeing an event 9-11 or larger. Uh, and if you do that calculation over the past 40 years, um, you find something like a 30% chance, which is uncomfortably high, but it does say the 9-11 was not unforecastable. Okay. So um, what do we learn when we cut the data in many other ways? We find that the power law is a really robust finding inside the severity data. We find that the power law pattern holds for different decades. You look at the 70s, the 80s, the 90s, the aughts. All of those different decades have a power law pattern in the tail for the s most of your attacks. It holds for different types of weapons, whether you look at uh, uh, events that were done with guns or with fire or with bombs. Each of these things follows a power law distribution as well. Uh, it holds whether you look at countries that are in the OECD or countries that are not. Um, but all of these things don't have the same exponent. So each time you look at the different the data in a different way, you find that that alpha exponent that controls how heavy the tail is, it moves around a little bit. And so there's not really a universal exponent that describes the severity of terrorist attacks once you start thinking about these covariates. There are a couple of covariates for which the power law disappears. And I think those are interesting because it tells us something about the mechanisms that's really driving this pattern appearing at the global scale. For instance, if we look at just suicide attacks alone, we don't see a power law distribution. Uh, there are essentially not enough large attacks uh, in order to create that nice linear curve in the log log axis. Also, if you look at sort of arbitrary regions, so like North America or Europe, you don't see that power law pattern emerge there. So that tells us something interesting. These are clues about mechanism if you want to dig into those. Okay. So this gives you a sort of a flavor of the kinds of large scale patterns I want to look at. This is looking at just the frequency of severe events. Um, but now I want to talk about terrorist organizations since that's the purpose of the talk. Um, in fact, the material from the first few minutes will come back uh, soon. Okay, we'll see it again. Okay, so terrorist organizations. In the data set that I'm working with, this MIPT data set, uh, which covers 40 years, um, there are 910 identified terrorist organizations worldwide. Um, I, I've heard of some of these. I mean, up here at the top, FARC, Hamas, Taliban. I've heard of those. Down here at the bottom are ones that I, I haven't heard of. Revolutionary struggle. I have no idea who those people are. Greece. Um, Greece? Okay, thank you. So these are the top 131 organizations by number of events that have been done with their name attached to them in the database. Uh, so there are, you know, almost 800 other groups down here. Most of them, um, well, okay, so, so we can ask some questions about these groups. We can take all the data and divide it into a bin. Each bin corresponds to one of the groups. We can ask something about the statistics across the bins. So one question we can ask is, when does terrorism end? Which is really saying, well, how long do each of these groups live? So uh, we can simply take the first event that's got their name on it as their start date, and the most recent event with their name on it as their sort of nominal end date. And of course, there's a censoring effect here because some of the groups are still alive, but okay. So um, if we look at this distribution, here's what that histogram looks like, and you find that essentially the majority of groups uh, don't last very long. Um, they, in fact, this one hit wonders, that's not, that's not being um, facetious, that's real. Uh, the majority of organizations in the database only ever do one event. Uh, the rest of them, though, are these long-lived groups that do more events. They live uh, for longer than a year, 35% live longer than a year. And it's these kinds of groups that I'm interested in now. Because the question we want to ask is, how does terrorism progress? What's the life cycle of a terrorist group with respect to these measurable variables like frequency and severity of the events? So this is how we're going to do the analysis. We're going to take um, each uh, bucket of, of events for a group, 
and we're going to um, put them in a sequence. Uh, that we know the first group, the first event is because we have the dates, second event, third event, fourth event. So we have this ordering of the events like this. We're just going to measure some variables about this sequence of events. We're going to look at the time between the first and second, second and third, etc. So how long does it take to go from one event to the next event in that sequence? And we can also measure the severity of the event as a function of how far along that sequence we are. It's very simple. So here's an example of what a life cycle of a terrorist group might look like. You say experience or time is, is on the x-axis. Uh, and maybe the delay variable between events is like this. So if that, if that curve is going up, then you're slowing down with time. It could go down, it could be flat, et cetera. These are different examples of what a life cycle could be. Perhaps, in fact, uh, you know, it, it's U-shaped. And so the delay is slow at first because you're young and you're stupid. And then you sort of mature and you get faster. And then you get old and decrepit and you slow down again. All of these things are possible patterns that could describe sort of the life cycle of a terrorist group with respect to how often it acts in terms of violence. Okay. So before we look at the data, here's a model. Here's a hypothesis. So how does terrorism progress? Attacks lead to recruitment. I create an attack. I get my name into the media. Some people say, hey, I like what you're doing. Let me come help you do that. So then I have growth, so I have more recruits, and that allows me to do more attacks. So the assumption here is that the, the group size and age is what determines the rate of events. Effectively, I'm assuming that that the production of terrorist groups, I'm going to model terrorist groups much the same way that Barbara did, um, or think about them as a firm. They have a product that they're producing. In this case, it's death, these events that they're producing. So the, the terrorist cells, these little manufacturing groups that are producing the events, they're all interchangeable. And the production of these events is a very low skill uh, 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 career, if you will. Uh, and so you know, if I want to produce more events in the same amount of time, I need more people. That's the, that's the model. So the group size and the group age determine the rate of attack. So we can model this mathematically. Uh, so there's a very simple simulation model that just describes exactly the process I, I told you before. We're going to make an additional assumption that, say, the severity of the event is also proportional to the size of the group. Because perhaps the more people I have, uh, the more resources I can marshal in order to carry out extravagant attacks. So I have some organization with some people. I create a new event. The delay between my last event and my current event is inversely proportional to my size. So the bigger I am, the faster I move. And the size of the event is proportional to the resources I have, which is my size. So the bigger I am, the bigger the event. That leads to recruitment. That gives me a few more people. I grow, and then I repeat this process over and over and over again. So then we're going to look at these two variables again, the delay between the events and then the severity of the events. Um, I won't show you data for this one because it's obvious. Right, so in the simulation, the severity of the attack just goes up over time. But the delay is going to go down over time. But how does it go down? It goes down like this. So this is showing the time between uh, the time to the next event as a function of the cumulative number of events that I'm showing you, and it has this nice power law-like function. It turns out not to matter on the details of the model um, how much recruitment I get, uh, um, what the exact proportionality constant is between um, the delay of the event, the, the delay from now to the next event, et cetera. All those things don't really matter. You get the same sort of power law function, one over effectively the size of the group. Okay, so this gives us a prediction that this very simple sort of labor-constrained growth-type model should, uh, should produce this kind of pattern uh, that we should see in the data. So let's look at the data. So we're going to take all 910 groups. We're going to create this sequence of their events and then measure the delay variable between each of them. And then for the first to second event, we're going to compute the average delay, second to third, the average delay, third to fourth average delay, et cetera. And we're going to just plot that function. So when we do that, we see a very nice... Mm, looking, like a power law looking like a power law function. So this is log on this side, log on that side. It looks very similar to what the model I just showed you predicts. There's a little bit of a deviation down here. right? This curve is bending up to some degree uh, because we can't measure delays that are smaller than a day between events because the, the time scale that we're recording the data is the, is the date. So that creates this correction term, which is in here. Uh, that causes that curve to bend up as we get closer to one. But effectively, uh, this function is approximately what the model predicted, which is very nice. Surprisingly, this model is incredibly clean. So if I look at the marginal distribution, so if I say I know that I'm on the 10th event for my group, and I look at the distribution of observed empirical delays for groups that have carried out 10 attacks, it looks like a log normal. In fact, it looks like the same log normal whether I'm at one or 10 or 100 events. So this suggests that there's something very clean here about the behavior of these groups at this large scale. This is the data collapse that shows you I can rescale all the marginals to fall on top of each other. So this really is this very nice smooth envelope that follows this central tendency. It's quite interesting. Okay. 
So this gives us some support for the claim uh, that, uh, that size really is the thing that determines the frequency of events, but it's, it's not, it's not a, a, a closed case yet. Um, we really want to be able to measure size itself and show that this variable uh, is related to uh, the, the, the delay between events. So we want to be able to test this uh, prediction uh, very directly. So we can do this um, in kind of a, a backhanded way, uh, in part because um, Victor Assel and Carl Rethemeyer collected some data on the size of the groups. It's not perfect data in the sense that we don't have, you know, we don't get to talk to the HR people about how many people they have in each of the groups. Uh, instead, they have these sort of expert uh, estimates of the maximum size a group attains over a seven-year period for a large number of groups. So that makes the prediction mean that the minimum delay should be inverse proportional to the maximum size. Okay, so it's not perfect, but we can still do this. So what we find is that indeed we see exactly the relationship we predicted, that this is log of the minimum delay as a function of log of the group size, and we see that we have this nice linear function uh, that relates these two variables. We can do better, we can then conduct a, a, an ordered logic regression model to ask, can we predict the size of a group based on things like the delay, the experience, and the severity? What we find is that delay and experience both significantly predict the size of the group, and the severity does not. Aha. <coughs> Hadn't talked about severity yet, that's a hint about what's coming next. So essentially, the, the theory here, this model of size being the main determinant of the frequency of the events, is looking pretty good so far. Now what about severity? Let's look at that. How does that change with experience? Here's what that data looks like. So same kind of plot. I'm showing you the cumulative number of events on the x-axis and the severity of the next event on the y-axis. It's flat. If you look at the marginals, you find this very nice collapse of all the marginal distributions. They look like power laws. That's surprising and scary at the same time because it suggests that severity doesn't change as a function of how experienced a group is. The biggest attack a group carries out could be its first event or its 100th event. And there's no pattern, no systematic pattern here that tells you when that event's going to happen. It's the same no matter uh, how old the group is. Okay, so what do we learn? The production of terrorist events looks like it's a labor-constrained variable. So bigger groups create more events. Those events are packed into the same amount of time, and so they look faster. It says that we had this attack recruitment cycle. So if you wanted to sort of break this pattern of accelerating the frequency of attacks over time, you have to break the recruitment of the group. Um, it says that, oh, I, I didn't show you the results for this, but we can also analyze groups by ideology. We find that those trajectories, the way they go from the top right-hand corner of being slow to the bottom left-hand corner of being fast, the rate at which they, they make that transition depends on their ideology. Religious groups make that transition the fastest. They're much faster than the other kinds of groups like separatists, for instance. Um, the attack severity is independent of organizational size. Uh, this is consistent with a density targeting mechanism for explaining where the power law comes from. I didn't get into that, but I can talk about it offline. Um, it's inconsistent with any models that assume particular internal dynamics of the group because there's no dependence between the group size and the severity of the variable. It also predicts that the biggest organizations um, are the ones who are more deadly over time because they're producing more events, not because their individual events are more deadly. Okay, so looking forward, um, I've told you some interesting patterns about global terrorism at both the sort of worldwide scale in terms of severity and also in terms of the individual groups. Um, what's interesting is that these patterns that we're finding here are remarkably robust, and that suggests that there might be real sort of macro political or social mechanisms that produce these kinds of patterns. Um, it tells us that we should really be thinking about attack production for these groups as this labor-constrained variable, more people, more attacks, essentially. Um, but it also points to a lot of interesting questions for future work, mostly which are related to thinking about mechanisms. How do we unpack these ideas to figure out exactly what mechanisms, me what mechanisms is producing them? Why is it that ideology seems to have some impact in terms of the acceleration rate? Um, and then what relationship do these things have to things like civil wars and interstate wars? Because terrorism is now playing a role in these kinds of things. These organizations sometimes grow up uh, to become governments. So thanks to a lot of people. And then um, here's a bunch of papers that I've written about terrorism. Thanks. Uh, really interesting, great talk. Um, if I had a folk theory that the severity of an attack, uh, so September 11th, everybody knows about, you know, a small attack 
not a lot of people know about. And my folk theory is that severity uh, modulates recruitment. Does your data suggest that that's not true, or is that too strong of an interpretation? Is it just that a small scale event is still visible to local community, for example? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, we don't have data on recruitment at all. All we get to see um, is the, the severity of the events as a function of time. Um, so we don't have information on recruitment. We don't have information on the size of the groups as a function of time. We have these maximum estimates over a seven-year period. Um, so we don't really get to see that kind of information. Um, but it does lead to a very interesting hypothesis that potentially you could collect information by doing some case studies. You could look at individual conflicts and ask whether or not the ability to carry out these spectacular events had an observable impact on their size and their, uh, their relationship with, say, the other organizations in the, in the conflict. Yeah. A, a, in other words, I don't know. <laughs> Yeah, Neil. It's a great talk, Aaron. I, I think I want to make a comment and then a question. This is a great example where Aaron and I look at the same data. We have a, su well, some, a, a different way of explaining it, but this is great because then it focuses it around the data and it focuses it around mechanisms that may be candidate mechanisms, maybe one's right, maybe the other's right, maybe a combination is right. Mm -hmm. But that's what I think is a very productive way forward. And, um, my second question, though, is precisely on a case study. So uh, if you look at the IRA, as I was showing yesterday, the IRA, they increased their production, their rate of attacks during the 80s, um, and they prune their network. Mm -hmm. So it could be, and it's what you said in front, it could be, it could be an element of expertise. It could be recruitment. It could be expertise. How can we begin? Because you're more for the recruitment, I'm more for the, and there's some expertise, more technology, all this kind. How can, how, Aaron, can we decouple that? Yeah, that's a really good question. So um, when I first got into this project, I, I was convinced that there was going to be a learning component um, to the pattern. And um, ha having thought about this and sort of soaked in the data for a long time, and um, what, I, what I believe is that, um, uh, so the literature on learning, for instance, tells us that um, certain kinds of tasks, these learning curves, for instance, if you, uh, the classic one is for, for Boeing uh, making airplanes in World War II, um, the cumulative number of airplanes that they made is a function of how much time it took to make the airplane goes down like a power law. So same sort of um, uh, progress curve. Um, and so, uh, you know, what, what caused that? Well, they got better at making planes. They also built more factories to make planes. Um, so there's sort of the, the gained expertise explanation of getting faster at doing things. Those kinds of, of patterns occur only when you have um, highly repetitive tasks. So in fact, there's these beautiful videos you can watch on YouTube of, of guys making Cuban cigars. Um, there's a fixed machine, and they get faster and faster at, at making these Cuban cigars because it's a repetitive task. So they learn how to cut the corners and how to do things faster and so on. Um, so it, it suggests that there are certain kinds of tasks for which learning has an impact and allows you to get these sort of orders of magnitude increases in the speed. Um, other tasks that are non-repetitive uh, that have to be thought out very carefully, like, for instance, writing academic papers, you don't get much faster at them over the course of your career, even after having done 100 of them. Um, you might become a factor of two faster over time, but not a factor of 100 faster, right? You're not going to write 300 papers in a year when you start off as a grad student writing one paper a year. That's not going to happen. You might get to the point of writing 10 papers a year. That's a big increase, but not two orders of magnitude. So my feeling is that... Um, for terrorism tasks, there is a learning component to it. You, go, you can have division of labor, you can have the, the factories that produce the, the explosive vests and things like that. That might increase the production rate a factor of two or a factor of three. But if you really want to get a factor of 100, you need more people. So I, I think that you're probably right that a combination of these ideas is probably the, the right explanation in the end. Um, but if you just want to get sort of like a first order explanation, I think size is the first order variable. That's true, because we've been fighting about this for like six years. <laughs> yeah. yeah, just one thing. I've, I've been working with these data for a long time as well, and um, the revolutionary struggle problem brought up um, a problem in these data with um, when you look at the groups as the unit, um, which is to say in countries like Greece, the typical trajectory is that you'll have um, one group that formulates, does one attack, and then goes away or mm -hmm. they'll never do another lethal attack again yeah. and so then they reconstitute with a new name yep. and so what happens is like in 2008 or whatever you have 26 groups in Greece but actually it's just one group of people who are anarchists who reconstitute themselves under new names each time 
So I'm not sure whether if you kind of clean the data um, to deal with that or whether you can use GTD to validate these responses, um, whether you'd get a cleaner set of standard errors or something. Um, there's a figure I want to show you. Uh, here we go. Okay, so if we look at individual organizations, these are the, the eight with the most events associated with them. Um, what you see is that some of them follow sort of the general pattern. You see the Taliban up here um, at almost 1,000 days between their first and second and second and third event, and then down here much later, they're at like the, you know, inner day uh, uh, interval. Um, but then there are interesting groups like Al-Qaeda in Iraq, and Islamic State of Iraq, that don't follow that pattern because they start off fast. And I think that you could use this kind of diagnostic to try to identify those kinds of groups, the groups that, that change their name or reconstitute or split up or, and so on. Because here, they're acting like a group that's much more experienced than they appear to be based on the number of events associated with, associated with that name. Well, they're all, so those are all insurgencies, yeah. Okay. Okay, great. Let's talk more. <laughs> Thank you very Thanks. much. Yeah, we're going to continue during discussion. Thank you.